Chapter Fifteen of The Doings of Raffles Haw by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Greater Secret. It was late that night that a startled knocking came at the door of Elmdene. Laura had been in her room all day, and Robert was moodily smoking his pipe by the fire when the harsh and sudden summons broke in upon his thoughts. There, in the porch, was Jones, the stout head butler of the hall, hatless, scared, with the raindrops shining in the lamplight upon his smooth, bald head. "'If you please, Mr. McIntyre, sir, would it trouble you to step up to the hall?' he cried. "'We are all frightened, sir, about Master.' Robert caught up his hat and started at a run, the frightened butler trotting heavily beside him. It had been a day of excitement and disaster. The young artist's heart was heavy within him, and the shadow of some crowning trouble seemed to have fallen upon his soul. "'What's the matter with your master, then?' he asked, as he slowed down into a walk. "'We don't know, sir, but we can't get an answer when we knock at the laboratory door. Yet he's there, for it's locked on the inside. It has given us all a scare, sir, and his goings-on during the day. His goings-on?' "'Yes, sir, for he came back this morning like a man demented, a-talking to himself, and with his eyes starting, so that it was a dreadful to look at the poor dear gentleman. Then he walked about the passages a long time, and he wouldn't so much as look at his luncheon. But he went into the museum, and gathered all the jewels and things, and carried them into the laboratory. We don't know what he's done since then, sir, but his furnace has been a-roaring, and the big chimney spouting smoke like a Birmingham factory.' When night came, we could see his figure against the light, a workin' and a heavin', like a man possessed. No dinner would he have, but work and work and work. Now it's all quiet, and the furnace is cold, and no smoke from above, and we can't get no answer from him, sir, so we are scared, and Miller has gone for the police, and I came away for you. They reached the hall as the butler finished his explanation, and there, outside the laboratory door, stood the little knot of footmen and ostlers, while the village policeman, who had just arrived, was holding his bull's-eye to the keyhole and endeavoring to peep through. "'The key is half-turned,' he said. "'I can't see nothing except just the light.' "'Here's Mr. McIntyre,' cried half a dozen voices as Robert came forward. "'We'll have to beat the door in, sir,' said the policeman. "'We can't get any sort of answer, and there's something wrong.' Twice and thrice they threw their united weights against it until at last with a sharp snap the lock broke and they crowded into the narrow passage. The inner door was ajar and the laboratory lay before them. In the center was an enormous heap of fluffy gray ash reaching up halfway to the ceiling. Besides it was another heap, much smaller, of some brilliant scintillating dust which shimmered brightly in the rays of the electric light. All round was a bewildering chaos of broken jars, shattered bottles, cracked machinery, and tangled wires, all bent and dragged. And there, in the midst of this unusual ruin, leaning back in his chair, with his hands clasped upon his lap, in the easy pose of one who rests after hard work safely carried through, sat Raffles Haw, the master of the house, and the richest of mankind, with the pallor of death upon his face. So easily he sat, and so naturally, with such a serene expression upon his features, that it was not until they raised him and touched his cold and rigid limbs that they could realize that he had indeed passed away. Reverently and slowly they bore him to his room, for he was beloved by all who had served him. Robert alone lingered with the policemen in the laboratory. Like a man in a dream he wandered about, marveling at the universal destruction. A large, broad-headed hammer lay upon the ground, and with this Haw had apparently set himself to destroy all his apparatus, having first used his electrical machines to reduce to protyle all the stock of gold which he had accumulated. The treasure room, which had so dazzled Robert, consisted now of merely four bare walls, while the gleaming dust upon the floor proclaimed the fate of that magnificent collection of gems, which had alone amounted to a royal fortune. Of all the machinery, no single piece remained intact, and even the glass table was shattered into three pieces. Strenuous earnest must have been the work which Raffles Haw had done that day. And suddenly Robert thought of the secret which had been treasured in the casket within the iron-clamped box. It was to tell him the one last essential link which would make his knowledge of the process complete. Was it still there? Thrilling all over, 
he opened the great chest and drew out the ivory box. It was locked, but the key was in it. He turned it and threw open the lid. There was a white slip of paper with his own name written upon it. With trembling fingers he unfolded it. Was he the heir to the riches of El Dorado, or was he destined to be a poor, struggling artist? The note was dated that very evening, and ran in this way. My dear Robert, my secret shall never be used again. I cannot tell you how I thank heaven that I did not entirely confide it to you, for I should have been handing over an inheritance of misery both to yourself and others. For myself, I have hardly had a happy moment since I discovered it. This I could have borne had I been able to feel that I was doing good, but alas, the only effect of my attempts has been to turn workers into idlers, contented men into greedy parasites, and worst of all, true, pure women into deceivers and hypocrites. If this is the effect of my inheritance on a small scale, I cannot hope for anything better were I to carry out all the plans which we have so often discussed. The schemes of my life have all turned to nothing. For myself, you shall never see me again. I shall go back to the student life from which I emerged. There, at least, if I can do little good, I can do no harm. It is my wish that such valuables as remain in the hall should be sold, and the proceeds divided amidst all the charities of Birmingham. I shall leave tonight if I am well enough, but I have been much troubled all day by a stabbing pain in my side. It is as if wealth were as bad for health as it is for peace of mind. Good-bye, Robert, and may you never have as sad a heart as I have tonight. Yours very truly, Raffles Haw. Was it suicide, sir? broke in the policeman as Robert put the note in his pocket. No, he answered. I think it was a broken heart. And so the wonders of the new hall were all dismantled, the carvings and the gold, the books and the pictures, and many a struggling man or woman, who had heard nothing of Raffles Haw during his life, had cause to bless him after his death. The house had been bought by a company now, who had turned it into a hydropathic establishment, and of all the folk who frequent it in search of health or of pleasure, there are few who know the strange story which is connected with it. The blight which Haw's wealth cast around it seemed to last even after his death. Old McIntyre still raves in the county lunatic asylum, and treasures up old scraps of wood and metal under the impression that they are all ingots of gold. Robert McIntyre is a moody and irritable man, forever pursuing a quest which will always evade him. His art is forgotten, and he spends his whole small income upon chemical and electrical appliances, with which he vainly seeks to rediscover that one hidden link. His sister keeps house for him, a silent and brooding woman, still queenly and beautiful, but of a bitter, dissatisfied mind. Of late, however, she has devoted herself to charity, and has been so much help to Mr. Spurling's new curate, that it is thought that he may be tempted to secure her assistance for ever. So runs the gossip of the village, and in small places such gossip is seldom wrong. As to Hector Spurling, he is still in Her Majesty's service, and seems inclined to abide by his father's wise advice, that he should not think of marrying until he was a commander. It is possible that of all who were brought within the spell of Raffles Haw, he was the only one who had occasion to bless it. End of chapter 15 End of the Doings of Raffles Haw by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Recording by Patrick Wells